everybody for coming to the Aaron Torres podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little subscribe button at the bottom of your screen, go ahead, click that subscribe button really does help our channel grow, our audience grow. And I really do appreciate it more than, you know, so click that subscribe button, appreciate your support. Now here's the video that you came here for. You know, we have a big story on our hands. Like, like when Michigan, Penn State, everything that has happened there, Michigan rallies to win. When that gets bumped to the B block, you know something big broke. And that is exactly what happened on Sunday morning as a story that we've talked about really for like two years now. A story that we've talked about multiple times just in the last couple of weeks. A story that bluntly I did not think was going to happen this year. I thought it could, didn't think it would. Oh, it happened. Jimbo Fisher, as first reported by Billy Lucci, TexAgs.com, want to give him credit because he is all over that Texas A&M beat. Billy Lucci reported and everybody else confirmed. Jimbo Fisher has been fired as the head coach at Texas A&M. Yes, he is owed $76 million at buyout, buddy. Oh, by the way, according to multiple reports and basically his contract, he is owed like $19 million of that within 30 days. This is shocking. This is stunning. I'll be blunt. I'm recording here early Monday, uh, early Sunday. Just woke up. If you're listening Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, forgive me. I'm going to go all over the place, dive in. My hands are flying. It's crazy chaos in the streets as we talk about Jimbo Fisher being gone. Okay. So let's dive in. Um, and I, and I want to hit on this from all angles, right? I want to talk about why it happened now, who's next, the portal ramifications, all that. But let me start with this. The first sign, you know, it's, it's not going well, first of all, it's not going good. We all know that. But I thought it was interesting that multiple outlets, Yahoo and ESPN, both reported there was a Board of Regents meeting earlier this week. That's never a good piece of news. Now, I know Board of Regents meetings happen all the time. But when you get all those powerful people in the same place, the football program is struggling. You know something bad is probably going to happen. And so what's clear is this was obviously a decision that was made probably Thursday, Friday. Didn't want to disrupt the week. They waited until Sunday to make it happen. If you remember a few weeks ago, Coach O, or a few years ago, Coach O, same thing happens. He loses to Kentucky, negotiates a buyout during the week. Uh, and I don't think he even negotiated. He was just given the buyout. And then they actually won on Saturday against Florida. He gets fired after winning a game. Jimbo Fisher, much the same. So this was clear, clearly been in the works for 72 plus hours. And let me just say, like, why did it happen now? Uh, there's a few reasons. One, the team simply isn't good enough. And, and we all know the numbers, but I do think they are kind of jarring. Even with the win, Texas A&M went to six and four on Saturday night, but six and four in year six simply isn't good enough. First of all, let's just get to the raw stats they're drawing. Texas A&M has not won a road game. I, I, I throw out these stats just to give you context of how bad things have been. Texas A&M has not won a road game since 2021, the 2021 season. Okay, Jimbo under Jimbo Fisher. They never won a single game on the road against a ranked team. So that gives you a little context of how things have been. We'll give you a little bit more context here as we uh, as we put the kind of moratorium on Jimbo Fisher. Finishes 45 and 25 overall, but 27 and 21 in SEC play. And bluntly, in year six, that simply isn't good enough, right? This was a guy that was brought in that was paid tens of millions of dollars to compete at the highest levels of this conference with the Alabamas, with the LSUs, with the Georgias, obviously Texas and Oklahoma coming next year. And so to be 27 and 21, to not have a single road win in two years and a couple things, this was kind of the year where you had to start building momentum. Everyone kept asking me in, in July and August, Taurus, what is it going to take for Jimbo Fisher to keep his job? And what I said is, look, you don't have to make the college football playoff this year. But you got to go nine and three. You got to build some momentum so that next year, when all those guys that were in that 2022 recruiting class are draft eligible juniors, you feel like you have a team to, that can compete for a national championship. And so, with that as an expectation, kind of nine and three ish, 10 and two, competing for a playoff berth, to be at five, be at six and four, including the win on Saturday, that's just not good enough. And beyond that, it's not that you're six and four, you've lost every meaningful game of the season. At Miami, when we thought Miami was good and they're not, loss. Uh, Alabama at home, when you built some momentum early in SEC play, loss in a game you could have won. Tex Tennessee, in a game you could have, maybe should have won at Tennessee, you lose and obviously Ole Miss a few weeks ago. And so all of those games essentially, except for maybe Miami, were winnable. 
all of them came down to a decision or two, a play or two, a moment or two, and every time Texas A&M was on the wrong side of it. And so I don't think there's any expectation that you were going to beat LSU two weeks from now. For people who don't know, know the schedule, they play Abilene Christian next, uh, and then from there they close at LSU. Don't think you're going to you're going to beat LSU. But then here's the other thing. And I, I heard this this week. I was kind of just calling around talking to people. I thought it was an interesting comment. They said the worst case scenario isn't finishing seven and five. The worst case scenario is finishing seven and five, bringing back Jimbo Fisher. And then next year, he over exceeds expectations, right? Because if you bring back Jimbo Fisher for 2024 at this point, one of two things is going to happen. And I just did, did finger stuff. You know, my hands were flying there. Forgive me if you're watching on YouTube. If you bring back Jimbo Fisher, one of two things is going to happen. Either you underachieve again, and then you just kick the can down the road for a year. And at that point, the SEC is that much tougher. Oklahoma, Texas are established, whatever. But here's the worst. Here's actually the worst scenario is that you don't trust Jimbo Fisher now. It's year six now. What happens if you end up actually meeting or exceeding expectations next year? And then all of those draft eligible juniors, the Walter Nolans, the Evan Stewart's, the whomever, Connor Wigman's, they all go pro. And then you're stuck with Jimbo Fisher another two or three years because you can't fire him off of a 10 or 11 win season. So even if he somehow meets or exceeds expectations, you're kind of even more screwed because then you're stuck with him for another two or three years after that. So it's a lot of money. I'm not saying that I would have been part of it, but I don't have billions of dollars to spend like some of these boosters. And so I get why it was done. And most specifically, because a lot of people are going to ask, why was it done now? The reason it was done now was point blank, simple. It was because of recruiting, okay? The bottom line is for people who don't follow the calendars, National Signing Day is about a month from now. And on top of that, the portal cycle basically opens, you know, right around the start, you know, right right after those conference championship games. And so I bring it up because you basically have to have a coach in place really about two weeks from today, two weeks from tomorrow, two weeks from this Monday, from Sunday, from Tuesday, whenever you're listening. Because if that portal cycle opens, and I think technically the players can get in the second that their coach is fired, but at the same time, if you wait, if you go too long, you know what ends up happening? If you start that search the day the season ends, well, by the way, what if you beat LSU and you go eight and four? But even if you pl- if you start it the, the day the season ends, then all of a sudden all those guys have days and days to get in the portal while you don't have a head coach. They have days and days to be contacted by other schools, to hear from other people. And so ultimately, listen, Texas A&M is still going to lose some guys to the portal once the season ends because that's every school in America. But I bring it up because ultimately the goal is to have a guy in place the day the regular season ends, maybe the day after, maybe the Sunday after, so that that guy not only could start recruiting, the most important thing that the next coach has to do is re-recruit the Texas A&M roster because in a 12-team playoff era next year, you have a playoff roster in that building if you can get the most of it. So let's really quickly dive into coaching candidates. Uh, You know, listen, this stuff is going to change over the course of the next two, three weeks. Forgive me. We're going to cover it a lot. We're going to probably do an update every single day based on reports. Okay. But I think the early reports are, listen, if you're going to spend 75 million plus to get rid of a head coach, probably a hundred million plus, if you include buyouts for, I'm sure DJ Durkin and and Mike Elko or Mike Elko, we'll get to him in a minute. DJ Durkin and Bobby Petrino are on multi-year deals. Um, if you, if you're willing to spend 75 to hundred million to get rid of this staff, my assumption is money is of no object. So I do think, look, they're going to kick the can on some of the biggest names that in theory could be available. Listen, say what you want about Texas A&M. Nobody thought Jimbo Fisher was available six years ago when they hired him. And then they made him an offer. He couldn't refuse. And then he ended up not refusing it. And that's how we got in this mess in the first place. But you start looking at candidates. I've seen the names. Listen, Dan Lanning is an obvious one. 30, mid 30s. I think he's got the blueprint. I think he's going to be great at Oregon. Great recruiter, great portal guy, great on game day, great evaluator, you know, fill in the blank. I think Oregon might be the second or third best team in the country right now. Same time, 20 plus million dollar buyout to get him out of his contract. So I know money is of no issue to AM, but now you're talking about a hundred plus million dollars just in buyout just to get Dan Lanning. And that that's including Jimbo, his staff and Dan Lanning. Plus, oh, by the way, NIL, this, that, the other thing. I, I don't think Dan Lanning is leaving because I think he's actually set up very nicely to have success at Oregon. I mean, Oregon goes to the Big Ten next year outside of Ohio State and Michigan. I mean, I, I saw Penn State on Saturday. Penn State ain't in the same stratosphere as Oregon right now. 
let alone the Illinois, the Iowa's, the Nebraska's like, like, nope. Like there's two teams right now that are built to compete with Oregon right now. And I think Oregon has maybe a better job. Now, Texas A&M has the better recruiting base, all that. But at the same time, like, I don't think he's leaving Oregon. Did see Kalen DeBoer, uh, Washington. One thing I'll say about him, salary is not that high. Um, but the 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 new AD, he kind of said on his opening press conference, remember Washington's AD, Jen Cohen, left for USC. The new AD comes in. He says, listen, getting Kalen DeBoer here long term, that is the end. That, that's my only priority right now. And so that that athletic department isn't in great shape financially, but guess what? They are getting one big check from the Big Ten here in the coming weeks and so or coming years. And so Kalen DeBoer, I mean, listen, I mean, if you could get him, get him. But he's from South Dakota, started his coaching career in South Dakota, success at Fresno State before he ends up at Washington. He feels like a West Coast, Northwest kind of guy. I mean, even if you, you listen to him in interviews, he doesn't say much. He doesn't talk much. He just kind of goes about his business. Don't know if you can bring that. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying I don't know if he fits Texas A&M, the culture, the excitement, the day-to-day grind of what that job is. Not really sure. Also saw Lane Kiffin. I'll just say this. If Lane Kiffin somehow took the job, that would be the most hysterical turn in the history of college football. First of all, this guy signed a huge contract last offseason. I thought we were done listing him as a candidate once he turned down the Auburn job, whatever. Yet here we are. But the way that Lane Kiffin has made fun of Jimbo Fisher, I mean, listen, I'll say this. There is clearly uh, an admiration for what Texas A&M has from Lane Kiffin. They just played two weeks ago. Lane Kiffin was talking about, oh, my God, greatest defensive line I've ever seen. NFL defensive line. I love the, the this and that, you know, and has made so many jokes and comments and pokes at the NIL stuff. Be very interesting if he took the job. Realistically, though, listen, and we're going to spend a lot of time diving into candidates over these next couple of weeks. But in my opinion, end of story, like when I look at this situation, the, I, 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 the guy, that, I'll just be blunt. The guy that I think is most realistic is Duke coach Mike Elko. If people don't know the background, Mike Elko is a guy that three years ago was the, the, the defensive coordinator at Texas A&M. And it's kind of interesting because you can kind of draw a parallel between the program was never great, but the program absolutely took a nosedive the second that he left. And why I think you consider Mike Elko, why I think he's probably the guy that ultimately ends up getting the job is because one, he knows, first of all, he's a great coach. Goes to Duke at year one, it wins nine games. This year, they're six and four, but their star quarterback, Riley Leonard, has been in and out of the lineup all year. Just getting that team to six plus wins, beating Clemson, destroying Clemson, beating Notre Dame. It doesn't get much better than that. Actually, they lost to Notre Dame, forgive me, but they beat, who was it, Louisville, uh, Cle- Clemson. They have a very good resume. But you start to look at Mike Elko, and a couple of things stand out. One, what's the ceiling at Duke? Listen, you, you don't root for a program to lose a a rising star in the coaching business like that. But at the same time, like, I mean, he loses his starting quarterback. The whole program goes in the tank. And so I just bring it up because of the fact that like, when I look at Mike Elko, there's such an obvious ceiling at Duke, even when things break, right. Even when Clemson is down, are you really going to be in a position where, um, you know, you're competing at the highest level. I just think it is just so, so, so impossible. By the way, the fact that they even competed with North Carolina on Saturday shows you what kind of coach this guy is. So I think he's a heck of a coach. And then for people who do not know, he obviously was the defensive coordinator at Texas A&M for a long time under Jimbo Fisher. And when I think is lost in the shuffle, he was actually the guy that recruited a lot of the guys that are going to be juniors on this roster. A lot of those defensive guys, Walter Nolan, uh, you know, whoever, They have relationships with Mike Elko. They have relationships with him. They like him. They believe in him. As a matter of fact, I remember talking to people around A&M. When he took that Duke job, there was fear to, you know, it was the the, the winter of 2021 into 2022. There was a fear that they were going to lose a lot of those guys because of their relationship with Mike Elko. So if you can get him, get him in that building two Sundays from now and have him ready to talk to those guys, I believe that most of them will stay. So Mike Elko to me is the obvious name. Lastly, listen, it wouldn't be a coaching carousel segment if I didn't at least address the elephant in the room. I have no idea about Urban Meyer. I'll be blunt. After I get done with this, I'll probably try to make some phone calls to Texas A&M. Would they ever actually be interested in Urban Meyer? I have no idea. But a couple things stand out. One, I've said it, and there's maybe another segment just on Urban Meyer to be had. 
Urban Meyer is going to coach again. Like, like he's not even 60 years old. Nick Saban's 72, and he's still going on like a, a freaking freight train, okay? Urban Meyer is 60 years old. He's younger than Jim Harbaugh. He's younger than Brian Kelly. I find it impossible to believe that he is never coaching again. And I think Texas A&M is one of the few places that would actually, that would actually really want him. I, I, I can't speak for every fan. Can't speak for every booster. Can't speak for every guy that's going to write a check. Can't speak for Ross Bjork, the AD. But Texas A&M wants to win. The SEC is getting tougher. Texas and Oklahoma are coming. You want to win. There's only one guy that's won at the highest of levels that's available, unless you get Bob Stoops out of retirement, and he ain't coming out of retirement. And so to me, Urban Meyer makes sense. I will say, by the way, I will say, we've talked about it when we've talked Michigan State. You know, the Michigan State people for a, a moment really thought he was interested in that job. I'm just going to tell you, I was told over the last couple of weeks that he's gone a little bit dark in East Lansing, and maybe that there was some speculation that Texas A&M could open. So I don't know. I'm just here to tell you, I, I don't think Urban Meyer is an impossibility. Lastly, let me say, and I know I already said this, if I can give one piece of advice to Texas A&M, just one piece of advice, it's pretty straightforward. Hey, Texas A&M, let's go ahead and make sure you have that guy in place ASAP, okay? I understand that if it's not Urban Meyer, you're probably not going to get him before two Sundays from now. But my piece of advice, go ahead and get that guy in place ASAP. Because Texas A&M's roster is good enough to win a national championship next year. Their recruiting class is currently in the top 10, and that's after multiple decommitments over the last couple of weeks. That recruiting class, that roster, I'm not kidding when I say I think there's probably 10 first-round picks on that projected for that 2024 roster based on what we know right now. And if you wait Texas A&M, and if you don't have that guy in place, I'm just telling you, we're about to see the greatest rush of portal talent that we have ever seen if you don't get that guy in place. The Evan Stewart's, the Walter Nolans. You, first of all, let me just make one thing clear. If you don't think those guys, the superstar guys, have been being hit up for weeks at a time, their, their, their agents, their whomevers, their high school coaches, whoever helps them, their parents, you don't think those guys have been quietly being hit up behind the scenes? You don't know what you're talking about, okay? They've been being hit up behind the scenes, and the longer you wait to find the next head coach, the more likely it is that you cannot retain a lot of that roster. Now, look, if you lose, you're going to lose a guy, you're going to lose guys because that's the nature of the business. But the idea that you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, I don't think it's pretty. So Texas A&M fans, uh, best of luck. Texas A&M, let me just say, first of all, Jimbo Fisher, it was fun while we knew you. I have no idea what Jimbo Fisher is going to, what the next part of his career looks like. 75 million to not coach sounds pretty good to me. We will see. Um, but Texas A&M, five, one piece of advice. Get that next head coach in place ASAP.